All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the final concluding lecture in the transvaluation of all value series. So that's it, no more values. Um, we'll just be done with that. Uh, a, st a, a stupid number of announcements tonight. Let's see. Uh, number one, people have been asking me what the series next year will be. And so I've finally, I've been putting this off, uh, sort of like surgery, I think. Uh, but I'm finally going to do it. I'm going to do the Germans. So this means I have to do Kant and Hegel, which is like, oh my gosh. But now that they're bad, they're great philosophers, but oh, the writing, the writing. Not, not mellifluous, let's put it that. Hegel, actually not so bad, but Kant, oh dear Lord. Uh, anyway, so we're going to do the Germans, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer. Um, I'm going to do Kierkegaard, sort of sneak him in, even though not German. Uh, but he was working in the German philosophical tradition and some more. So that'll start in September uh, of 2019. And then also this summer, again, starting in July, uh, no, starting in June, what am I saying? Starting in July, that's a slip, starting the first Tuesday in July, and then every Tuesday all summer through September, I'm going to do the history of philosophy out at Thin River. So come on out, it'll be beautiful, um, food, uh, cider, fun, just loveliness, and a barn in which I'll be doing the history of philosophy um, in 16 weeks, which should be a challenge. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, 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 June starts in June. First Tuesday in June. Yes, that, I was I was hoping I had said July, but I actually agreed to June. So we'll have to start very soon. It turns out, shockingly, shockingly soon. When I agreed to do that about two months ago, that seemed real far away. Like, wow, that's way out there. And all of a sudden, it's not as far away anymore. I'm not sure what happened. Um, so. All right, so transvaluation of all values conclusion. I was trying to think about how to, to, to come around back to grips with this. And so two things sprang to mind. One is uh, we're just primates. We're primates with some extra trimmings on top, but we're still primates. And if you look at a lot of monkeys, particularly the ones that swing to trees, some monkeys jump, but there are monkeys that swing through trees and they never let go of the branch they're holding until they reach a new branch. This is the way monkeys get around in trees, which is smart. This is not a stupid thing. Um, but I think with the transvaluation of all values, what we're facing is we have to let go of the old branch, and we don't know where a new branch is going to be if a new branch exists. We're not exactly clear how far it is from our tree to the rocky ground below. Um, I really think that's essentially what we're faced with. Our old values, our old systems are breaking down. We don't want to let go of them, but we have to. Um, another way of thinking about it, too, is the ancient mariners, particularly in the Mediterranean, but all over the world, they like to sail in sight of the shore because that way you know where you are. Once you lose sight of the shore, if you don't have the vision of a new shore in front of you, you're just sailing into the void. But again, if you're going to find a shore that's been not discovered, you have to sail into the void. At some point, you just have to let the coast behind you vanish in the mist in the distance and go, wow, I wonder what's out there. I hope it's someplace we can land and get water, right? I mean, that's sort of the dream, is that we'll be able to reach something good to replace what we're leaving. In this case, I would say what we're leaving is not necessarily by choice. In fact, I think historically speaking, it's generally not by choice. We're forced to do these things. We don't volunteer to do them for most people. Some people are out on the lead, cutting edge. They want change, revolutionaries, whatever. But most people are like, no, we're pretty comfortable with how things are. But then those things start to fail. Those things start to fall apart. And so we're in a new world, a new place. And we just have to let go of a lot so that we can begin to reach uh, what's coming. And I, I really think that's the analogy for where we're working. To wit, it, I thought, let's look back just the last, you know, since 1950, I said some significant changes. And these aren't necessarily all just sort of important things, but these are substantive value challenging moments that have uh, fundamentally undercut old beliefs. They don't provide new beliefs. This is the important thing. Usually what happens is your old beliefs get smashed 
before you get new beliefs to replace them. And so there's this awkward transition period. We're in the awkward transition period. You may have felt this. Like I said, is, 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 you, pro you probably noticed this. So uh, it's 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Unanimous Supreme Court decision, by the way, astonishing, is to say, theory, theory the, the, the finding was, look, you can't have segregated schools. You can't have separate but equal. Fundamentally, though, what it said is you have to treat people equivalently because people are fundamentally the same. There is no essential historical precedent for this. We've never believed that, not in our society, not in any society. We just, have, we just don't believe it. If we think our people are good, the people across the border are bad. If we think men are good, we think women are dogs. If we think the ruling class is great, the slaves can be killed willy-nilly. You're the wrong race, the wrong skin color, the wrong religion, the wrong thing. We can just shoot you, kill you, burn you. That's fine. That's human history. Brown versus Board of Education said there is no class of people that is less and can be treated that way. Now, this didn't solve anything. This created an entire raft of problems which we're still trying to sort through with varying degrees of success and failure. Um, so th this is one of the beginnings of this, right? You, you can't treat people as if they're second rate, regardless. And by the way, it, it was African Americans, of course, which is to say the worst people. So when you say the worst people can't be treated poorly, you're saying everybody has to be treated the same. And, and again, culturally, this is just a radical concept. Um, and then 10 years later, Civil Rights Act signed into law, not unrelated, of course, but a further pushing of this precedent. Um, and, and many, many of the legal cases that are being argued right up until today are a fight about this central tenet. Are there a class of people, any class of people, for any reason that we get to treat as second or third or fourth class citizens? And again, historically, the answer has always been absolutely. And we've been trying, and so we've been fighting this out. But it's a real, it's a huge change, and we're still not sure culturally, as a civilization, how we feel about it and what it means to try to implement it. And then on a different tack, in 1969, we put a man on the moon, famously. Um, again, it's hard to describe the impact of this. It's a truly phenomenal moment in world history, because. Uh, like launching a satellite, of course the Russians did that first, so we don't like to talk about the satellites, but this, this, this notion of being able to take a human being off of the planet, but much more importantly, the ability to stand on the moon and look back at the planet. That's the revolutionary moment. To be out in space and look back at the planet and go, oh, wow, we've never seen it this way before. Uh, the first Earth Day takes place roughly the next day. You get that shot of the Earth floating in space, and all of a sudden people go, wait a second. You, you can almost, many thinkers, it's an original with me, but they peg the beginning of the serious and big scale of world environmental movement to that picture of the Earth taken from space. Because, the, because now we can conceptualize it, now we can see it, now we can feel it in a human way, that we're this little blue thing floating in space. It's one unit. We can never, we never, you know, we have globes, you have maps. You can sort of think about it. But when you see it like that, now you can internalize it. So it's a huge shift, dynamic shift. Um, 1973, Roe versus Wade. Again, this is simply an extension of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Who gets to decide what women do with their bodies? Uh, women? No, we've never said that. That was never the answer in the entirety of human history. And then all of a sudden, we're like, well, maybe women. Let's give that a shot. See how that goes, right? Again, that's, that, that for the entirety of human civilization, women have been, at best, second-class citizens. So you're talking about a symbolic movement. And this is part of a larger movement, of course, to, to transform the situation of half the population of your country. That's not a small, that's not a tiny change in your cultural transform. We're still trying to work this out. This is st we're still like wrestling with this. What does it mean 
to take half of your population and change their fundamental standing. And again, the laws are just the, the sort of symbolic level of this. It's really it, trying to make it work culturally. So in day-to-day -day life, this is how people interact and experience the world and just go, oh yeah, these are our values. This is what's normal. Um, 1975, end of the Vietnam War. Uh, again, the whole cycle of the Vietnam War for, of course, the United States was, was um, traumatic. And, and it demonstrated what people keep starting talking about today and forgetting the history is that there are deep schisms in the country. One of those schisms is the role of the United States in the world. What are we supposed to be doing out there? And also a clear defeat. That is not, see, we're not the defeated. We're the victors. It was a huge challenge to the notion that the US is the winner and everybody else, well, if you're on our team, you can win. If you're not on our team, well, then you're the loser by definition until Vietnam. And so, by the way, there's an entire industry that has been rewriting the history of the Vietnam as a victory for the United States. It's hard to believe, I'm not making that up. You can look this up, but we actually, it turns out we won. I'm not sure what we won, a prize, a trophy, a ribbon, participation award, apparently. Um, but, this, but that's the, we must have won. We had to have won because we're winners. Ah, until you're not. This is a huge blow. Um, 1982, Equal Rights Amendment fails. So this whole equality for women thing, well, it's a nice idea. There's many legal scholars who argue that it's already implicit in the Civil Rights Amendment and all kinds of other laws that you actually maybe don't even need it. But culturally, we weren't prepared to actually just pass that, which is indicative of, of the tension, that it passed a bunch of states and didn't pass a bunch of others, means we don't know. Right? That's the, the tension. Um, 1991, collapse of the Soviet Union. This is an easy one to overlook because it's a certainly big event. But um, after the World War II, it's important to remember that before World War II, America was an incredibly isolationist country, uh, Roosevelt, uh, the first Roosevelt notwithstanding. Um, and then all of a sudden we weren't. And so we had, for about 60 years, organized our sense of ourselves as opposed to communism. Again, we're winning because we're beating communism. We're the better system. How do we prove it? By, by showing them that we're better. So we sent symphony orchestras around the world, and we funded the arts, and we had big universities, and of course a very impressive military, and we were friends with lots of people. Why? because the Soviet Union was evil, a threat, and we didn't want to just defeat them, we wanted to show them we were better. And then they collapsed. And so what's the purpose of your government now? We don't know. No, honestly, we have no idea what a government's for anymore. Are they supposed to, what, keep us safe from whom? I mean, we have a massive military, and it's not pointed at anybody because who are we being protected from? What, why should we send symphony orchestras around the world? We don't do it anymore because we don't, we're like, oh, that's right. We didn't never care, but we now what? See, we're just at a loss. I mean, this is, by the way, there's, historians talk about this is your government needs to have a narrative that makes it make sense. Our narrative vanished in 1991. And we thought, this is great, a new world of of something good, fill in good things here. And it turns out that, yeah, we've lost our narrative. So even at that structural level, we don't know what's going on very much anymore. Uh, 2003, last laws against homosexuality overturned. 2003. I, I, every time I, I'm always like shocked by that. Because I think, oh yeah, homosexuality, 67, not eight, not, 2003. Finally, the last laws against homosexuality overturned in the United States by the Supreme Court. By the way, this was a legal battle. Um, and then not that long afterwards, uh, you get uh, 2015 gay marriage becomes legal throughout the United States. So, so that's a huge jump from not illegal to you can get married in 12 years. Um, this is... Uh, 
culturally disruptive. It shocks people. Something that was illegal in most of the country in 1990 to not illegal in 2003 to, fine, you can get married, 2015. That is a rapid, uh, much late, but, but still huge cultural shift. So it, even just these few, if you look at this, for the last 50, 60 years, it, it's been serious sort of change of cultural values, challenge, technological innovation, change in the role of the United States in the world, change of the cultural expectations at home. Can I marry a black woman? No, totally legal. Oh, yeah, you can. Sure. Oh, black president. Black first lady. What? All in one lifetime. Not over 100 years, not over even 50 or 60 years for a lot of this. 2003, by the way. Did I mention that? Homosexuality. <laughs> I mean, it just, it just like blows my mind. I, ah, what the hell are we thinking? Ah, and, and, and so, you know, just that fast. It's hard for, for individuals to keep up in this stir, to figure out what's going on. And I always think Barzon, I mentioned before, has the, the best definition for this. He says, in classical periods, you agree about what you're arguing about. We know what we're arguing. We don't agree, but we know what we're arguing about. In periods of decadence, he uses the word decadence for this, you don't agree on what you're arguing about. And so you can't even argue effectively because you simply don't share enough values that you have any concept about what you're talking about. And that is absolutely clearly 100% where we are. Um, and it's disturbing, of course. So communally it's disturbing in any sort of larger cultural level. Uh, and again, you can just think about this if you ask yourself any general question um, about the world and ask yourself, does our culture agree, for instance, uh, any big ticket item, right? So, well, so Washington and several other states have legalized marijuana. So in roughly now, I think uh, approaching half of the states, marijuana is legal. And in about half the states, marijuana is a felony that can get you life in prison. This is, this is not a small, like, so some people are saying this is one of the most dangerous things you can do and you should be put in prison for a long time or life or totally fine, let's tax it and fund education. So you don't agree about any, I mean, there is like not a lot of overlap in these positions. That, that's, that's what's happened. So the, the generally what people thought was, oh, in this argument, what will happen is we'll shift from people going, oh, it should be illegal, it's not that great. And then you'll go to, well, it's not that harmful, but we don't want to legalize it, to, okay, you may as well legalize it because who really cares anyway, and we get some tax revenue from it. What actually happened was some people said, no, it's fine the whole time, and they, you know, de facto legalization on the West Coast for about 30 years, right? Um, and, and, and then they said, so sure, let's just legalize it because it's practically legal anyway. And other parts of the country, just the entire time, have said, no, it's just evil under no circumstances, shouldn't be allowed. So this is a bifurcation. Uh, and so, how, you know, where does the overlap there? The only overlap I can see is that it generates tax revenue. And that seems to be a great unifier of, of, of American thought. Oh, it generates free tax money. That's great. Um, but you, you know, think question after question that we face. A couple of years ago, this is going back maybe about 12 years, the, 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 the Army Air Force, I think it was just the Army. If not, it was the whole military. But I think it was just the Army. Anyway, they're having trouble recruiting. So uh, recent events in the tourism in the Middle East with the American military had proved not that great for recruiting people. Um, and so they did a survey, and they asked young people, the target audience, what would you like to see from military advertisement, you know, market research, that would help you join the military? Overwhelmingly, 100%, what they wanted to see is nation building. The US military goes out in the world helps people, builds bridges. If there's a tornado, we put in pumps and save your people and we rescue from storms and we protect you from the evil people and we make your life better. 
And the U.S. military said, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> they do do this. This is the crazy thing. They actually do this. The American military does all this humanitarian work all over the world, and they don't want anybody to know because it's controversial. <laughs> Isn't that weird bomb shit? Yeah, absolutely. Lead, the, lead on the news. Look, our missile's bombing people. Yee, we love that. Culturally, we can agree on that, more or less. It's getting less agreeable. But the notion that we might go out and help people with our military, which we do, again, like we actually do it, but they don't want people to know. So we're not sure what the military is for. The military is not even sure what they're for. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing because they're like, what? We have aircraft carriers, and we're fighting people who, who have guns. They don't have missiles, even. They got a mortar, but we've got an aircraft carrier. You know, it just doesn't, it, it's complete misfit. And they, these are smart people. They're not confused about the problem. They're just like, anytime they think about a solution, their, their minds just stop. But, but, but I think it's our problem, too. Our minds tend to often stop. And we get gripped with fear. And this is one of the things I want to focus on. Again, I mentioned this earlier, joy, not fear. Fear is the mind killer. You cannot think with fear. And so much, people like, uh, you know, global warming people. Yes, global warming is happening. But this terror, end of civilization, people keep saying. I'm like, this, this is absurd. If three quarters of the world's population dies, civilization will go along just fine. I mean, it'll be horrible for humanity. If you like people, that's bad. <laughs> but like the history of civilization is filled with these events. It seems stupid to inflict one on yourself, but we've done stupid shit throughout history. <laughs> but this notion of trying to scaremonger people into things simply freezes the mind. And everybody's doing it now because people are really filled with fear. Uh, and so I wanted to look at some uh, quotes here, and I, the, it's on the back page. I don't know why I put the one I wanted to start with in the middle of the back page. Uh, but this is from Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, or Nicomachean, 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 I'm not sure. Um, Courage is the first of human qualities because it's the quality which guarantees the others. And the idea here is we're faced with a world in which Sometimes we're confused, sometimes we're afraid, sometimes what we want to do conflicts with what we think we ought to do. And the only way you can make the decision to overcome what Aristotle referred to essentially as your animal self is with courage. If you have no courage, you are simply a slave, according to Aristotle. You're a slave to yourself. And courage can be thought of as simply, okay, I felt fear, and I decided I was not going to allow that to control me. I have the courage to look at my fear and go, okay, that's fear. Now let's think anyway. Not stop at the fear, but begin to think anyway. And, and several commentators in Aristotle's time, and Aristotle essentially comes around to saying, in fact, the only ethic, ethic that matters is courage. There is really only one. Without courage, you're doomed, and with courage, well, you, you're, on, you're in business. The rest may follow. But all the thinking and talking and imagining and reflecting in the world without courage is pointless. And so, um, then from there, I like this Simone de Beauvoir, who, I was just talking to somebody else, I'm like, every time I read her, I'm just like, oh my gosh, she's just amazing. And she, you'd think she was writing today. She has so much power, and she's so topical, and she's so focused, that it just blows my mind every time I sit down and read her. <clears throat> she says, regardless of the staggering dimensions of the world about us, the density of our ignorance, the risks of catastrophe to come, and our individual weakness when the immense collectivity, the fact remains that we are absolutely free today if we choose to will our existence in finiteness, a finiteness which is open on the infinite. So, so regardless, no, she just says it straight out, regardless of the staggering dimensions of the world, the world is huge, unknowable, complex. The density of our ignorance, yep, we're wrong. We don't know a lot of things. The risks of catastrophes to come, yep, going off a cliff, we don't know. And our individual weakness, 
within the immense collectivity. We are in these big, we're in states and countries and legal systems and historical systems and economies. These are huge collectives. And we're just these weak, tiny individuals. So she's not sugarcoating it. I guess that's my point. She's just sort of, you know, like, here you go. But the, the fact remains, we are absolutely free today if we choose to will our existence in its finiteness. Will our existence, we're finite. We can will it in our finiteness. A finite which is open on the infinite. And in fact, any man who has known real love, real revolts, real desires, and real will knows quite well that he has no need of any outside guarantee to be sure of his goal. Their certitude comes from his own drive. I mentioned this last time. It's got to come from inside, weight, weigher, and measure. There's no external, objective, absolute guarantee. And in fact, if you search for one, Simone de Beauvoir suggests you're probably on the wrong path. That drive has to come from the inside, even in the face of all of this. Um, and, and I thought an another way of thinking about this is the quote from Krishnamurti. Uh, one is never afraid of the unknown. One is afraid of the known coming to an end. I think this is a really great. I'm not sure we're never afraid of the unknown, uh, but I'm sure about that last one. We're mostly afraid of the known coming to an end. And then again, like Simone de Beauvoir, he doesn't pull punches. He doesn't like leave it vague and sort of amorphous. He says, the known being, your house, your family, your wife, your children, your ideas, your furniture, your books, the things which you have identified yourself, with which you have identified yourself. When that is gone, you feel completely isolated, lonely. That is what you are afraid of. That is a form of death, and, it is only, and, and that is the only death. So you're, you're seeing and feeling the possibility of all this loss. And again, this is the monkey on the branch or the sailor at the shore. I don't know what's over there, but I do know what's behind me. And I'm terrified that if I let go, I'll lose everything. That's a type of death. He said that that, that fear is, a, the fear itself, by the way, is what he's referred to is a type of death. Right? Seeing that, not theoretically, but actually seeing that one is afraid of losing everything that one has owned or created or worked for, one asks, is it not possible to die psychologically every day to everything that one has known? Can one die every day so that the mind is fresh, young, and innocent each day? Then life has a different meaning altogether. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of a challenge, I would say. Uh, it's going to be uh, a bit tricky to pull off, but the, the, the core notion there is, yeah, if you can every day let go and go, well, it's different. It's going to be new. Not easy, not simple. But then your mind is fresh. And then you can start again. You can, you can restart. And we always talk about this. We say, oh, we want people to have new values, to get rid of those old ideas. Why did it take till 2003 for homosexuality to be legalized? Well, it's because people were terrified of homosexuality. Why? I've never figured this out. But anyway, so they just, they were. But if you could wake up new every day, you could go, does this make sense? Do I, have I had negative encounters? Have they done anything that I should interpret as in any way threatening to me? Probably the answer to all these will be no, and then you go, right, great, let's move along then. So these trained fears you have to carry with you. Another way of thinking of it is you carry your trained fears with you from day to day. We, you keep them up, you feed them, you nourish them. Here's a little food for my fear today. A little food for my fear today. Keep that growing. Keep it healthy. If you let go of it, it dies. Free your mind. Ah, uh, but that's the courage problem. Right? And then last quote, last quote from um, Schopenhauer, odd, odd group, Krishnamurti, Simone de Beauvoir, Aristotle, and Schopenhauer. So we're just moving through philosophical history at random here. Uh, but, but hopefully there's some link. Uh, we'll see. Um, true loss is just as impossible as true gain in the world of appearance. Only the will exists. It, the thing in itself, is the source of all those appearances. 
Its self-knowledge and its consequent decision to affirm or to negate is the only event in itself. So, so there's the idea of uh, both de Beauvoir and Krishnamurti are talking about, and Aristotle for that matter. The inside is what tells you what all the world of appearances is really about. I would just, just as an example, you may have heard the teen suicide rate has spiked up. We're in this terrible, um, you know, sort of wave of, of horrible and tragic deaths of young people. And we're trying to figure out what the cause is. A lot of people think social media, perhaps, cell phones, iPhones, smartphones, digital communications, something. Um, statistically speaking, this is total and complete bollocks. We are, I mean, not, we don't want teen, su we want teen suicide to be zero, of course, um, but we are not in a tragic wave, not a huge up spike. We are not even as high as the suicide rate was in the 1990s, when it probably wasn't smartphones causing teens to commit suicide. And yet, that's what we're told. Something has gone tragically wrong with young people. Um, one good way to find out if this is true would be, of course, to talk to young people. But we're not going to talk to young people because we're an incredibly age-segregated society, by and large. Also, we know old people are hopelessly out of touch with the world. They're backwards. Their values don't matter. They have no knowledge that's useful. And so if you want to start a company or you want to hire somebody, you need to get young people who, if they haven't committed suicide, are apparently quite good at things. <laughs> And the old people are not. And the young people won't check this out because we're an incredibly age-segregated society. These sorts of stories are repeated to us endlessly. And so we go with them. And since we don't test them often, we tend to sort of go, well, sure, that makes sense. The Deep South is a terrible place. No one wants to live there. It's all poverty and ignorance and backwardness and racism. Except lots of people like living there. Lots of them have high quality of life. And actually, they have remarkably low rates of depression in many of these states. And so, OK, you know, this is, I was talking to my students, you know, we know things about the world, like, OK, you red state, blue state, Washington state, very blue state. We are remarkably left-leaning state, except when it comes to things like education, which we won't fund because uh, we don't believe in it. And then everyone knows Texas is backwards and sort of retrograde in every possible way, except for the fact that they're huge investors in education, particularly higher education, particularly higher education to give opportunities to just about every student in their state a chance to go to college. And that's like, well, wait a second. Can that be true? But see, ah, and, and these narratives, and, but by the way, we're, we're inundated with so many narratives that it would essentially take forever to unravel them all. This is our problem. How, how do you adjust in a world where our, where our old narratives, our old stories are crumbling? We're trying to grasp onto new ones. We don't have time to check them all. We have to ponder, reflect, and think. Step one, though, so this is the conclusion of transvaluation of all values. Step one is, again, not to give in to fear. Fear simply kills your mind, even if what you're afraid of is true, even if it is actually something to be feared. Often not the case, by the way. Often things that we're told to be terrified of are simply not that terrifying. But even if it is true that what we're afraid of is worthy of fear, it's good to identify that and then stop being afraid of it. Because you can't think when you're afraid. You freeze, both literally in the sense of something attacks you, like a, like a bear. Or, by the way, if, if, if you're ever in a fight, if you're boxing or in a fight or something unpleasant like this happens, the difference between a regular person and someone who's been trained is regular people freeze in a fight because they're afraid of the pain of being hit. When you learn to box, the first thing you learn is, oh, it's fine to be hit. Just relax. This is all they tell you. Just relax. They're like, that guy's trying to hit me in the head. Just relax. Just re Once you relax, it's an unbelievable advantage. If one person is tense and afraid and one person is relaxed, the relaxed person will win every single time. 
That's all it is. When you get two relaxed people, now that's a whole different story. <laughs> but if you have a tense person and a relaxed person, you just can't do anything when you're terrified and you're afraid and you clench up. Same thing happens psychologically. If I'm afraid that uh, my wife is going to leave me, if something terrible like this is going to happen, then I tense up. I get nervous. I get afraid. I've got to do something. Or I can say, OK, that's a possibility. Because it always is a possibility. This is, this is the power, the, the desperate sort of core of love, is to love somebody is to say, yep, you can just kill me. I'm giving you the opportunity to just rip my heart out. I would prefer you didn't do that. That would be great. But that to the extent that you open yourself up to somebody and give of yourself to somebody, you're saying, yeah, you can absolutely pummel me and inflict incredible amounts of pain on me at my invitation. Of course, this is voluntary. You are making it possible. And so if that fear of that will, A, either freeze you from opening up to somebody, or if you've opened up a little, then it'll cause you to close down from fear. Right? This is why I always think early stages of relationships, friendships, or romantic relationships, it doesn't matter, are all about showing one card at a time. Right? I'll show you one card if you'll show me one card. Right? And you're always terrified that you're going to show the card and the other person is going to go, <gasps> and you go, oh damn, not that card. Oh crap. <laughs> right? I put that card. I didn't have that card. I don't know where that card came from. Who, right? That's it's sort of this because we ah, you don't want to just because somebody can then potentially really truly harm you. And that and but this overcoming of fear, I think, as Aristotle says, is both the beginning and the end of the transvaluation of all values. Uh, the second thing is, is to go back for a quote from I had from Nietzsche earlier um, and expand on it. And this is the idea of basically looking at the world and saying, I love the world exactly how it is. This is one of the most difficult, truly difficult tasks. Because if you don't love the world how it is, you will never see it how it is. You have to say, I want the world to be as it is. Because that's how it, that, that is how it is. Now, we're only going to be, like, like Simone de Beauvoir says, we're finite, we're limited, we're vast at our ignorance and tiny in the infinity of the world and the universe, but to the, way, to the capacity of the human mind to open up and say, I want the world to be how it is, and I want to be able to see it how it is. Because if we say, oh, I don't want to think that, Again, this is the, the blinder goes down and some part of what's going on around us vanishes. And then it becomes very difficult to figure out what to do with our values, how to interpret the world, how to know what it means when we've just shut things down. That's not possible. That's not real. That's not true. Be not because the evidence suggested or my experience suggests, because if it were true or if I did accept it, it would really threaten some things that I hold to be true, or how I want the world to be. I mean, we all want the world to be different than it is, of course. I think, most people, at least. We don't look at the world and say, wow, it's just perfect. I'm not saying that. But the first step is to say, but it is as it is, and I have to want to see it that way. If you don't really want to see it the way it is, it, you'll just see it through this haze of all this training a lot of which is based on fear. <laughs> to have the courage to embrace the world and to say, look what's going on. And, to, and again, to want it to be that way. Not to say you want it to be that way forever. Not that you don't want to see it ever change. But however it is now, it's, it's very difficult truly challenging because we see so many horrible, awful things in the world and we think, I wish that were not so. It's a very natural response, very admirable response, human empathy. But it is so often. 
Sometimes, by the way, it's not so. Like I said, sometimes we think terrible things and it turns out, well, that's just not so. Um, but we still have to do that. Then, if you can kind of, to the extent, again, finite human minds can embrace what's going on, and then look inward and say, yeah, what do I really think about that? There's a great quote, I forget, I think it was in the New York Times uh, about 15, 20 years ago when outsourcing of jobs was really at its peak and it was controversial. Now we're just used to it, of course, that's what you do, right? But it was when it was sort of controversial and they were talking to this uh, very wealthy businessman and he had just closed down a factory in the United States and laid off a couple of thousand people, sort of destroyed a small Midwestern city, you know. Um, and they said, well, don't you feel bad about this? And he said, no, I just hired 20,000 poor people in India and improved their lives dramatically. And it's like, ooh, damn. Right? Now, so, f right? See how that's a problem? Well, is, is, is he a terrible human being or has he helped 20,000 Indians? Or is he just doing all of that so that he makes even more money? There you go. Right, right, so there you go, right? So, so uh, but, but notice, to if you simply said somebody has gone from employing 5,000 people to 20,000 people, would you say that is good or bad? Right? But 5,000 Americans we know are vastly more worthwhile than 20,000 Indians because they have so many of them, <laughs> right? Roughly speaking, yes, you see, you see this, is, this is how, like, oh, well, they just, they, ah. Right, we don't, ah, but no. Americans are more important. We know this, vastly more important. But why, why again? We also know again that the Chinese are bad for some reason. Um, but it, by far, without doubt, the single greatest source in the last 50 years of lifting people out of poverty has been the Chinese government. They're doing, they've been doing it in China at a phenomenal world historical rate. Nothing like this has ever been seen before. I mean, truly, titanic lift. And now they're doing it all over Africa. Africa is booming, and it's booming in part because of vast investment by Chinese businesses, which is all the government, by the way. Chinese business equals Chinese government. Um, vast investment by the Chinese government through Chinese businesses. Vast infrastructure projects. Vast investment in intellectual capital, Chinese engineers training African engineers. It's, and and they're, they're literally lifting Africa rapidly, rapidly out of some of the world's most dire poverty. Those awful people. Now, it doesn't mean that they're perfect. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. But you ah, you got to open your mind and go, well, are, are not the Chinese worthwhile? What's going on? right? These, these narratives that we're told of the goodies and the baddies, who we should like and who we should dislike, who's good, who's worthwhile. But again, you have to actually open your mind and ask, well, what's, what's going on? What's, what's happening? And then, what do I think of it? And again, this is what we're always going to come back to. It's perfectly reasonable to say, yeah, that's all well and good. But if you're doing that under a repressive communist regime, I think it's better to have freedom than to have this lift out of poverty. This is a reasonable ethical argument. But notice it's an argument. It's not a clear, un, un, you know, written on stone fact. And so, you know, or, or even, even the notion that the, some of the fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. If you have some spare a couple of hundred million dollars in your pocket today, your financial advisors are probably saying, you know what, we want to be investing in Africa. Where are the returns? Africa. There's a couple of major American corporations that are uh, profit neutral in every part of the world except Africa. They're making almost all of their profits now because it's developing so rapidly in such a huge market. America is a developed market, you know, and so we go, wow, we don't think of Africa as booming. 
We don't think of Europeans as moving to Africa for job opportunities, although this is happening in large numbers. Educated Europeans are looking around going, where are job opportunities? Africa, often in their former colonies. So, you know, it's like, oh. So I just picked these things at random because, again, we're in this massive change, but it's got to go back to you. And so step one is to ask yourself, I would say, once you have the courage, look at the world, look inside, and then say, what do I care about? What matters to me? Because one of the beautiful things about humanity, I would say, in our human condition, is no matter what you do, someone will criticize you for it. <laughs> you are always wrong, according to somebody. So if you gave $10 million to build a children's hospital, someone will say, why aren't you fighting homelessness? If you do something to help homelessness, someone will say, how about those cancer patients? No matter what you do, fund the symphony, oh, that's just for wealthy people, you should be giving your stuff to the children's hospital. Right? So it's just this circle. And people are often looking for outside institutions, as I mentioned, to justify, to come back and tell us what's right. And you can find that, but only if you close your eyes off, if only if you shut your ears and say, whatever this institution tells me is good, I'll take it as good. If you look outside of that, People will tell you you're wrong. And so first thing is to say, what do I actually care about? What's valuable to me? What do I think is important? Now, other people can think other things are important. I'm not telling them what's important. Because then that gives you a measuring stick. And that's what we're talking about with the transvaluation of all values. Because then you can hold a measuring stick up and say, People say this about that, but my measuring stick is, say, beauty. Does this make the world more beautiful? If yes, good. If no, bad. They want to put a freeway in. It'll relieve traffic. It'll do all this stuff. If it's ugly, I'm opposed to it. If it's beautiful, let's do it. They're doing something in Seattle right now, in, in, in uh, downtown. I just heard on the radio today on the classical music station. They were talking about it. Uh, they're uh, putting some like transit system in, and they're cutting down like a hundred, hundred-year-old trees. So, so on one hand, like ah. Uh. Now, if I lived in Seattle, this would be a true tragedy, because they need more trees, and they need less Seattle. If you've been to Seattle, it's sort of like wow. It's not. They're not doing. It's not. It's not getting more beautiful over there. Um, but notice it's public transit. And so somebody can totally reasonably say, look, I would rather give up the trees so that we can move people more efficient through, the, through this and help the planet, by the way, right? Sort of, you know, reduce emissions, move people around, make the city more livable. Yay. Somebody else could say, uh-uh, you, unless you've got some hundred-year-old trees that you're going to plant across the street, I'm not really for that. Don't tear down things you can't replace, I think is always an interesting rule. Um, you know, you, you, if you can't replace them, you can't get rid of it, right? But notice, ooh, I don't know who's right in that. I mean, I know where I would stand, but I can't say the other people are just out of their minds. But if you have a measuring stick, or maybe a couple of measuring sticks for different situations, then you can go, oh, I don't care what everybody else says on the entire planet. I think this is either worthwhile or not worthwhile. Again, as someone who's a huge classical music fan, um, you can read an article roughly every year that tells you classical music is dead. Um, it has been dying for several hundred years, by the way. These articles go way back, which is hilarious. Um, what they mean is classical music is not broadly popular. Notice this is very different from dead. <laughs> Give or take, most of us are not broadly popular. <laughs> this is not the same as dead. But even if you're the last person on the planet who is listening to Beethoven or Mozart, Bartok, classical music is perfectly fine. For you, it's great. And what else do you need? How many people out there? 
Along the same lines, I was just reading a, a very depressing article about the, the, the current state of the humanities in the universities. And there's a whole raft of these articles, one more depressing than the previous one, so I recommend not reading them. Um, but the general claim is, and thus the humanities are dying. What they've done is they've decided that the humanities live at the university like lions in a cage, and that if the zoo or the circus gets shut down, then there are no more lions in the world. There is absolutely no historical evidence whatsoever for this position. Shutting down the universities, all of them, which I think would be a tragedy, uh, but would not equal the death of the humanities. <clears throat> And certainly the reduction in the size of English departments, although I'm very much in favor of English departments, uh, would not represent the end of literature. In fact, it might even be helpful. <laughs> Some might suggest, not myself. But, you know, there, but this notion, right, of what, why is this true? I mean, and so one thing you could ask yourself is make a list of your 100 favorite novels. Maybe that's too many. 10 favorite. We'll just shorten it up. But you could do 10, 20, 50. You pick the number. It's up to you and ask how many of them relied on a university to produce them. I believe Dostoevsky went to the Iowa Writers Conference. He was one of their least favorite pupils, I imagine. <laughs> Gambler, drunk, aggressive, didn't speak English, hated America. Uh, you know, he's not going to get along too well there. Uh, but fair to Midland writer. Uh, you know, I mean, just James Baldwin was not invited for some reason. Can't think of why. Um, you know, what, what, what do we, what's going on, right? So again, education good. Humanity's good. They're not the institution. And so we get confused. And so people get horribly depressed. Oh, or again, the global warming people who say, oh, well, this is the end of the planet. No, 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 no. Planet's fine. Planet doesn't care about us. Planet totally indifferent to our existence. Planet used to not exist. Then it was really hot. The Hadean, named because of Hades, right? The Hadean, really hot. Lots of asteroids smashing it. So think that was the planet was fine because it was a planet. Doesn't care. In, in a couple of billion years, sun's going to get bigger and burn this place to a cinder. <laughs> So before then, we're going to need to move, by the way. So start packing. Um, so in between that, what we really mean to say is it's going to be unpleasant for us. But for some reason, we don't want to say that because it puts the onus back on us. And that what we're really talking about is how pleasant can we make the planet for us? And I think making the planet pleasant for us is a really great goal. Because otherwise, it's going to be unpleasant for us. See, it's not really a, that complicated of, a, of an argument. But it has nothing to do with the planet or nature or extinction. People always talk about extinction. Yeah, it's horrible that we're driving things extinct. But nature doesn't care. Nature is a massive extinguisher of life. Comets, life. Volcanoes, life. Snowball earth, right? Total ice. Total planet covered in ice. Really thick. This wasn't great for a lot of life. Bacteria were like, works for us. <laughs> but a lot of other life was like, oh, this is sad. So that we're an event, maybe, like an asteroid, a comet, snowball earth, super volcano, is sort of, we can ask ourselves if we want to be that. I would think we probably don't want to be that. But that's us. That's our, value. That's our measuring stick. And people try to put it out in nature or on the planet. But the, the, a tree is not holding a measuring stick at us. The planet doesn't say, oh, you guys are doing good or ill. We do. It's up to us. But you see how we always reverse that. We always confuse it. We want to take our values and somehow put them in the world, and then we can see them outside and go, oh, they're great. Look, there's an outside verification that I'm good. It doesn't rely on me. No, it relies on you. Read the Schopenhauer, read the Simone de Beauvoir. It always comes back to relying on you. Um, so, courageous. Two, accept the world. Look at the world and all of its blemishes. By the way, this works for us as well. I think we're, we're very good at hating ourselves. Right? We like to see our flaws and say, if I just weren't whatever, 
I would love myself more. This is the absolute path to never loving yourself very much, by the way. The path to loving yourself is saying, yes, this is how I am, and I love myself anyway. Or even better, and I love myself because of this. To, to see, to accept, to embrace, and then think. And then develop these measuring sticks from inside out. It's really clarifying. And by the way, now, as I keep mentioning, necessary. You have no choice. Because all the old systems that we used to rely on are sort of, we're getting nervous about them. We're getting like, oh, you can never lose money in real estate. <laughs> that one kind of went up in smoke. <laughs> what, by the way, it was never true. I mean, it's one of those great ones that people kept saying this right in the lead up to the housing market collapse. And I'm like, the entire history of modern economies is real estate speculation bubbles and busts. It starts all the way back with the Pacific bubble. I mean, it just, it's like, it goes way back, hundreds of years. And yet people are like, yes. And that's fine until it goes boom. And then we get nervous. Like, hey, wait a second. That narrative was not accurate. But I want it to be, have been true. Right? That, that you know, American, American government, American democracy is unique in the world. We're a shining beacon of hope and order in a world of chaos and corruption, right? This was always a dubious historical proposition. But I think even well-meaning people who believe this are now becoming somewhat suspicious of this story, um, right? And it, but it, I think we, you have to say it's a little nerve-wracking. You know, it's a little like, oh, I wanted to believe. As I mentioned before, like this huge eruption of sort of aggressive overt racism was, was, was been shocking to people. Like I said, those people were the white people. African Americans have been mentioning this sort of like, hey, over here, question, you know, for a while, 400 years. Um, and then it's like, oh, wait a second. This is the, by the way, this is the problem of the aberration. If you're in a system you like and something goes wrong, you say, well, that's an aberration. It's a one-off. You know, nothing works perfectly all the time. That's simply one of those times. 99% good, 1% bad. Yeah, that happens, right? It's an imperfect world. But if enough aberrations accumulate, when do you begin to say, oh, wait a second, maybe this institution, this system, this group, this whatever, is, is, is not working for me, is not actually good. The, the painful but, but, but difficult example I always like is, is people in, in physically abusive relationships, right? Well, he only beats me once in a while. He doesn't mean it, right? And so actually I can almost see the logic here. If you have a good relationship and once every 10 years somebody beats you up, could you say, oh, that's an aberration. I think potentially, right, human flaws, stress, or an unusual situation, I, I don't know. Once a year? Yeah, once a month? Woo. Once a week? Okay, now wait a second here, right? I mean, but, but notice, when does aberration become pattern? See, that's totally internal. There's nothing to do with anything outside. This is, this is internal values transition where you have to say, oh, wait, what I thought was just, no, those, those turn out to be bad. And notice retroactively, this is the scary thing, retroactively it makes all the previous aberrations become pattern. And now you've got to accept that, oh, I wasn't, I'm not wrong today, I've been wrong for this entire historical march, for however long it is. I have to reevaluate lots of stuff. And that, and that really, this is, this is the core. Right? When we look inside, find a measuring stick and hold it up, a lot of times we'll go, oh, wait, maybe that doesn't meet my standards. And finally, the problem I think maybe central to everything is this joy problem. It's weird to say joy problem, but I want to say joy problem. 
Uh, because for some reason we seem to resist this. Uh, and I'm never quite sure why I have some ideas, but um, fundamentally I think one excellent question that came up earlier um, that I've been pondering is, is, okay, joy is good, we want joy, but sometimes you have to go through trouble or pain or struggle to arrive at joy, right? It's not always just there on your doorsteps. Two-day shipping, Amazon, free with Prime, uh, right? This is just an arrived gift wrap. Well, how do you know when what you're enduring is the endurance that brings joy and is joyful, therefore, as you do it? Or when are you just doing something stupid that inflicts pain on yourself? And the question to that answer is yes. Yes, that's the question. The answer is, you've got to decide. I would say probably 90-10. 90% of the time, the pain is totally unnecessary and being inflicted on us by ourselves for reasons that are sometimes easy to track down, sometimes yeah. difficult. And, and I'll give you a, a couple of examples I think are sort of classic from our culture. One is we like to say, no pain, no gain. Athletes out there, you've got to work, you've got to struggle, you've got to like, ah. But if you enjoy doing that, it's not a struggle. It's joyful. And if you don't enjoy doing that, you should probably do something else. Because <laughs> being a high-level athlete requires a lot of this. And, and you can look up a video online, there's, I can't remember his name, he's a, he's a famous climber, I think he's Polish, climbs all over the world, Andre, 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 something like this. And they did a day, what he does in a day, and he gets up and he goes to a gym and he climbs, then he goes to another gym and climbs because it's nice to change location, then he eats lunch and he goes to another gym and climbs because he climbs with other people at that other gym. And then he gets home at night, exhausted from a long day of climbing, and he has a room that's just climbing stuff, and he just climbs in circles in the room. Now, he might have a mental problem. <laughs> this is possible. <laughs> right? It could be. He's a little off. But he's not, you, he's not like going, oh, i got to climb again today. He's not like, oh, if I really work and struggle, and str I'll be able to win a prize, and then everybody will say I'm lovely. It's like, wow, look, climbing is great. And I think this is where a lot of the pain, struggle, confusion comes from. Are you doing it because you love it? Or are you doing it like, like, uh, because you want to reflect glory on you when you get to some arbitrary external goal? So people often talk to me, oh, I want to be a writer, which I always think is the dumbest thing to say, by the way. I want to be a writer. I'm like, great, you're literate, okay. You have pen and you have a piece of paper. You can use a pencil, I think that's allowed. Congratulations, you're a writer. I often think what people mean is they want to have published famous books. Oh, see, that's different. That's a totally different thing. To want to have published famous books is not to want to be a writer. Um, and so then it's a struggle. Oh, I struggle with writing. It's a pain. I was a I rack my brain. I'm like, why? Because I want to have been a famous, I want to, I want, it says, well, just hire a ghostwriter. This is how you do this. Rich people know how to do this. You don't struggle, you hire a ghostwriter, you put your name on a book, and they feel great about this, by the way, because they never wanted to be writers anyway. They want to have written famous books. See? And so finding out whether it's an internal measuring stick, I have shit that I want to get out, print, mumbling at people in lectures on philosophy for hours on end, <laughs> or, I want some reflected version of an external system that tells me you're great. Ah, be very careful, the external versus the internal. And so this is, this is the core of it. Values are changing. Our world is changing rapidly. We all know this. And the arbiter of what this means can either be you or some external arbitrary system that you do not control. I recommend you. I think you're gonna do a better job, at least for you. 
than any external system, however well-intentioned, however well-meaning, however pleasant and wonderful in every possible way. But the caveat there is just what we read. Courage is the first of human qualities because of the quality which guarantees the other. It takes simply courage. Look at our fear, let it pass, and then think for yourself. Come up with your own measuring stick, and then reevaluate the world. Because transvaluation of values does not happen externally, it happens internally. You have to remake all the values that are being unmade for good or ill. Thank you very much. Transvaluation of all that.